And this week on Mama Murdered a Podcast, there sadly will be no new episode. I know, I know, I know, I'm so sorry. But your girl has had a lot going on in the last two weeks. And it's been, ex- it's just been extreme chaos and a emotional, physical, mental roller coaster. So, to explain just a little bit, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because it's all really fresh, just happening, but a really good friend of ours was recently killed. He was shot by a kid, like 15 years old, so we had to go to North Carolina for the viewing this past weekend. The funeral service will be this upcoming weekend, and then the day after we got back from the viewing of the body for that funeral, one of my best friend's daughters was pregnant. She was due any day now and delivered her baby at home in the toilet and it was a stillborn. So, needless to say, I haven't had a lot of time or even the energy to put into researching an episode for this week. So instead, I'm gonna throw you a bite-sized episode that would normally be only available on Patreon and we'll be back to like normal scheduling next week, I promise. And for the Patreon members, you will still get your bonus bite-sized episode this Friday. Don't worry about it. It's still coming. So I'm really sorry this is also last minute, but I wanted to at least update a little bit before I just threw like um, an episode at you that the Patreon members would have already heard. But this was the best option that I could think of for how to fix this little problem. I didn't want to send you with no episode this week. So instead, I'm making a little compromise. We're compromising. It's fine. We're going to be fine. So here is your weekly dose of me. And until next week, bye. You are listening to Mama Murdered a Podcast, and this is a bite-sized episode. And for this bite-sized episode, we're covering the case of Rebecca Sedwick. This case revolves a ton around cyberbullying and how quickly that can get out of hand and become something a lot worse. So, this case takes place between the year of 2012 and 2013 when the internet was pretty prominent and smartphones were everywhere. Granted, the camera quality wasn't what it is today and the storage was trash, but still, everyone had some kind of ties to the internet by 2012 to 2013. And this case really only takes place between the end of 2012 and the beginning of 2013, so not even a whole year. Rebecca Sedwick was born on October 19th in the year 2000 in Florida. And things were relatively normal for Rebecca until she was about 12 years old, when she experienced her first heartbreak from a boy. Even though Rebecca had been the one to break up with this boy, things at school started getting out of hand for Rebecca pretty quickly. So it seems like the boy that Rebecca had broken up with had gone on a date with another girl at their school. And after that, the other girl just kind of had it out for Rebecca for what seemed like no reason. Whether it be bullying Rebecca online or terrorizing her in person, this little girl made it her life's mission to bully Rebecca. But Facebook and Instagram were a few of the other main ways that this girl liked to bully Rebecca. And in December, after this cyberbullying and in-person bullying began, Rebecca's mom noticed that she had been cutting herself on her wrist. So Rebecca's mom did the one thing that she thought would help, and she had Rebecca hospitalized for a three-day treatment that would include talking to a counselor for a few months once she was released after her three-day hospitalization. But after that three-day stay, Rebecca was sent right back to school where the bullying continued. Not only did it continue, but it also got progressively worse. And Rebecca's mom had gone to the school and talked to the school to see what could be done, but ultimately, I think the girls were just, like, separated, and then the teachers and staff just tried to, you know, keep the two girls away from each other during school hours. So, of course, that didn't do much because kids are assholes and teenagers are the worst. So, the bullying eventually got so bad that Rebecca's mom just pulled her out of school and made the decision to homeschool Rebecca for the remainder of that school year. Which I feel like this just has to show how bad this had gotten if her mom was willing to uproot her 12-year-old daughter from her primary school just to try to stop bullying. It had to be pretty bad. And as it turns out, it was. 
Rebecca's mom even decided to take Rebecca's phone and she even deleted all of Rebecca's social media accounts because the majority of the bullying was happening online. And it seemed like that was working. Rebecca's mom started noticing a difference in her daughter. She wasn't as sad and upset and anxious anymore. And things really did seem to be looking up for Rebecca. So once the new school year started, Rebecca opted to go back to public school, but she actually switched to a different school in hopes that this would kind of be a fresh start. Rebecca had planned to try out for the cheer team at her new school, and she wasn't self-harming anymore. So along with starting at this new school, Rebecca's mom decided that she could have her phone back, but that she still wouldn't be allowed to have an Instagram or Facebook account, and Rebecca agreed to those new rules. But she's also a 12-year-old girl, so she just found different social media apps to download in the place of Facebook and Instagram. Rebecca downloaded apps like Kick, which I'm not even sure what that is, but I'm guessing that it's like an app that you can talk to and message other people on who also have a Kick account. Rebecca also downloaded other social media apps like WhatsApp and Ask.fm, which I'm not sure what that is either. So naturally, Rebecca's mom thought that she had kind of eliminated the possibility of Rebecca getting cyberbullied on Facebook and Instagram. And it's highly probable that her mom didn't even know that half of these other apps even existed. Because like I was just saying, I have no idea what the Kick app even is. But sadly, it was through these new apps that the cyberbullying continued for Rebecca and it started back up even worse. But because she had already changed Rebecca's schools and deleted and deactivated her Facebook and Instagram accounts, Rebecca's mom thought that they were in the clear, but the online cyberbullying never stopped. And Rebecca's mom had absolutely no way of knowing how far this online bullying had really gone, but it was all happening online. And then on September 9th, 2013, Rebecca's mom ran across some school books that Rebecca would have normally taken to school with her when she'd left. She also found Rebecca's cell phone, which was also something that Rebecca would have taken to school with her when she left the house that morning. But Rebecca hadn't gone to school that day. Instead, she had gone to an abandoned cement plant that morning and climbed to the top where she jumped to her death. So naturally, after finding this 12-year-old girl that had committed suicide, the first thing that police wanted to see was Rebecca's cell phone that she'd left behind that morning as she made her mom believe that she was leaving for any other normal day at school. And once Rebecca's phone was accessed, things started coming to light. Rebecca had even gone so far as to change her username on the new social media sites that she had downloaded to, quote-unquote, that dead girl. So she had changed her username to that dead girl. She had also messaged two separate friends that morning saying her final goodbyes. And this is when it was kind of learned how far this cyberbullying had actually gone. There were about 15 different girls who taunted Rebecca to kill herself every single day. Rebecca had multiple, 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 multiple messages on her phone that read things like, Drink bleach and die. Why are you still alive? Go kill yourself. Nobody cares about you. You seriously deserve to die. You're so ugly. Everyone hates you. You're so fat. Why don't you just kill yourself? And that is just a fraction of a fraction of the slew of messages that Rebecca was receiving every single day relentlessly. And all of these were messages that were coming from the girls that attended the school that Rebecca had been pulled out of. And it wasn't just like one of these girls was just a huge asshole and like sending these messages back and back. No, it was like 15 different girls. And as if telling Rebecca every single day to go kill herself wasn't bad enough, a Google search that Rebecca had made was later recovered from her devices and some of the searches are legitimately heartbreaking. One search said, what is overweight for a 13-year-old girl? Because these girls were also driving home the fact that they thought that Rebecca was overweight and ugly and all of these other awful things that just weren't true. It was also learned that Rebecca had searched Google asking how many Advil pain reliever pills she would have to take in order to kill herself. But this search really drives home how young Rebecca actually was because the search actually said something more along the lines of like, how many Advil do you have to overdose in order to die? That doesn't make sense, and the word overdose isn't even used properly. That just goes to show that she was so young, she didn't even realize what an overdose was. 
And it was about a month after Rebecca's suicide that two girls were, were arrested and charged with aggravated stalking. And these two girls were kind of the ringleaders to the other 15 girls that had just kind of jumped on the bandwagon of telling Rebecca to kill herself. And I almost feel like this was one of those things where one or two girls started it and then a few more people chimed in and by the time it was all said and done, that most of these girls were probably thinking like, well, what I said to Rebecca wasn't that bad because everyone else is saying something worse. Or, you know, maybe thinking like, well, everybody else is telling Rebecca to kill herself, so it doesn't matter if I said it too, because I feel like that's how most preteens and younger teens think, but these girls that were arrested were 14 and 12. That is so young. And they were arrested after the 14-year-old girl had posted on Facebook saying, quote, yes, I know I bullied Rebecca and she killed herself, but I don't give a fuck. And then it was like Facebook groups were made just for her bullies to be able to post about how glad they were that she was dead. Her mom had to go through and read these. It is just so sad. And the mom of the 14-year-old who posted on Facebook that she didn't give a fuck that Rebecca killed herself, yet that girl's mom claimed that she had been checking her daughter's phone every day and that her Facebook account must have been hacked and that her daughter was even asleep at the time that that post was made, which I call bullshit, but let's keep going. And then, I mean, what do we know? The mom to the 14-year-old was actually arrested too because a video surfaced online of this 14-year-old girl's mother beating the ever-living shit out of two boys. And I'll actually post the link to that video here on Patreon so that you can go watch it if you want to. And if you didn't know any better, you would probably think that that video was of a few teenagers fighting because what grown-ass woman punches kids? But it's not. It's a whole-ass mother in the video throwing all these punches. So I guess it's just like the sheriff in this case said, the apple really doesn't fall too far from the tree. And that just could not be more true than what it is in this case with this 14-year-old and her mom. Now, there was a lot of controversy about this case and about whether or not these girls should be charged for Rebecca's suicide. And then you'll never guess who represented this 14-year-old girl in court. None other than Jose Baez himself. You know, the same Jose Baez that represented none other than the world's most hated mom, Casey Anthony. And I'm just assuming here, but it seems to me like Jose Baez loves to throw himself at a case that is going to be potentially a high-profile case. But that's just assumptions. But whatever he does, he's almost too good at his job because just a month after these charges were pressed on these two girls, they were then dropped. And these charges were dropped because there wasn't enough evidence to show that their actions alone are what caused Rebecca to take her own life. So essentially the courts weren't able to prove that these girls and their actions were the one and only reason that Rebecca took her own life. And then of course CNN brought up the fact that Rebecca had been struggling with depression and self-harm in the past. And then it's crazy because in 2012, Rebecca had actually made accusations that her mom had been abusing her but she later recanted those statements about her mom being abusive. And it was also reported that Rebecca's home life could have also potentially played a factor in her decision to take her own life. And this was said because it was said that Rebecca slept in a recliner at home and that she didn't sleep on a bed. It was also said that Rebecca's clothes weren't kept in a dresser drawer or hung up in a closet, but that they were instead stored in plastic grocery bags. And I'll say this, my youngest son absolutely refuses to sleep in his bed or even in his bedroom. He has his own room with his own bed and his own TV with his own dresser and his own closet. But for whatever reason, he absolutely will not sleep in his room. He sleeps on our couch in the living room every single night by choice. And he's almost 12 years old. He's done this for years. But actually, now that I'm thinking about it, he only started doing that after we bought this house because before that, he had never had a problem sleeping in his own room and in his own bed. So maybe it's his room and maybe I need to sage our house, but I'm getting off topic. All that to say that Rebecca could have potentially chosen to have slept in the recliner instead of a bed. But then it wasn't really clear if Rebecca just didn't have a bed at all, or if she had a bed and just chose to sleep on the recliner. But regardless, none of that equates to bad parenting or not being in a loving household. Being poor doesn't make you bad. 
Maybe they didn't have the money for a dresser or hangers or a mattress and a bed frame. We don't know their home life, but that's what was reported. That these were possibly reasons that Rebecca would have wanted to have taken her own life. And I'm not even sure who should be held responsible here in this case. Like, should the school be to blame for not doing more when Rebecca's mom insisted that she was being bullied? Should the bullies be held responsible or should it be their parents for not monitoring their kids and what they're doing online? I'm not sure. I'm just not sure about anything on this one. But that is all I have for you this week on this bite-sized episode. I love you guys so much. Thank you so much for being here. And until next time. That's how my mama murdered a podcast. That's how my mama murdered a podcast.